Spain to cutting carbon emissions to net zero by 2050. This is a very important step towards the modernization of our economy. And now we think that it is a very good time to take a step forward. Because we are all discussing all along Europe and all over the world how we are going to facilitate the economic recovery after this huge economic and social crisis induced by the coronavirus. And we thought that it was the right moment to come up with a draft law to facilitate a sound and sustainable recovery. Listen, it is, as you say, a draft law. How confident are you that the main thrust of the law, the ambition to be net zero by 2050, will be achieved by the final legislation? I am pretty confident on that. Uh, my impression is that the Spanish society backs the carbon neutrality goal. There is one single political group placing the extreme right that denies climate action should be a priority. But all the other political parties back this climate emergency response. So listen, how does this fit in with the wider discussions in Europe for a coronavirus recovery fund that would include an element of green recovery. The French and the Germans recently announced a 500 billion euro recovery plan. I mean, how does this all work with Spain's ambitions to go net zero? I think it is important that we work together to provide sound responses to problems that go beyond borders. So, yes, I think that it is a very good news that President Macron and Chancellor Merkel did provide this common view on how to face the coronavirus. Uh, response. But listen, will it be enough? Because there will be urgent demands for economic recovery as we gradually emerge from the pandemic. Can we afford to have a kind of energy upheaval at the same time? Can economic recovery really be consistent with a Green New Deal, the kind of thing that you're suggesting in Spain? I think it is. I mean, the green energy is already much more competitive in terms of cost and security than the fossil fuel-based energy solutions all over the world. And in that context, Spain is blessed with wind, sun, maritime water, and trying to orientate new investments into this field is a good driver for new jobs. We need to ensure that we do not miss any of the opportunities linked to this transformation. And the other way around, if we do not do it, we will be taking much more risk and it could be much more costly. So I think that, that yes, the recovery should be green or it won't be a recovery. It could be just a kind of shortcut into similar problems to the problems we have been facing up to now. One of the things that I was fascinated by was the suggestion that the European Recovery Plan could be funded by an EU-wide carbon tax. Now, do you think that is likely and how significant would it be if it was brought in? Well, I think that we need to ensure a level playing field all around the world in terms of environmental and climate concerns. And now we have learned that trade is a very useful tool, but it needs to be consistent with the values we are trying to fix in the multilateral agenda. The Spanish Deputy Prime Minister, Teresa Ribera. Well, Europe looks set to lead the charge on decarbonisation, but climate change can only be contained if the whole world acts. So what about the United States, the home of the original New Deal of President FDR back in the 1930s? President Trump pulled the US out of the Paris Global Climate Change Agreement, but he's up for re-election in November. And the talk in Washington is that his Democrat opponent, Joe Biden, has some big ambitions for a green recovery. David Roberts is an energy and climate change journalist for the liberal-leaning American news website, Vox. He's been sending a lot of signals that he's targeting a FDR-sized presidency, is what one article said, and the idea being pushed by climate activists in the United States now is a Green New Deal, sort of modeled on that original New Deal. And that's a real shift in mainstream U.S. thinking on climate. You know, if you'd asked me two years ago, I would have described the Democratic coalition as a bag of cats. They couldn't agree on anything. But over the last two years, I think, the Democratic coalition has sort of aligned around something more like industrial policies, sector-specific standards 
and targets and aggressive investments and a more active hand for government. Okay, so this is going to be about what they call an energy transition, a move away from fossil fuels. How might a Biden presidency do that? What might that look like in practice in America? Right. Well, the core part, the standards I was describing, go after three big emitting sectors, which is cars, buildings, and electricity, driving them as close as possible to net zero carbon by 2030. And then there's these huge investments in infrastructure, long distance transmission, electric vehicle charging infrastructure to create lots of jobs. And that's one of the big political advantages of this approach is people who might lose their jobs in the fossil fuel industry, you know, you can make serious promises to them that there will be other good jobs available. So that's its political sailing point. But listen, to what extent can you say with any certainty, Joe Biden buys into this stuff, this is part of his agenda? Well, he signals both that he knows he needs youth enthusiasm, he knows he needs the left, he knows he needs kind of the core democratic base, and he knows climate is probably the best issue to get that. The climate is the issue that polls the best across all those groups. Climate even polls pretty well among wavering Trump voters. So it's become a political advantage. So I feel uncharacteristically uh, optimistic. Uh, <laughs> you said, you said about, reluctant to admit uh, it, David. <laughs> well, I mean, look, look, look around. Look at what's going on here in U.S. politics. But signs look good. I've been talking to people for weeks about this. I have yet to find anybody who doesn't feel that there's a common direction. On the left, on the Democratic side of politics, because there is a, a very stark contrast if we look towards the Trump presidency. I mean, how would you characterize Trump's approach to these issues? Well, uh, it's not subtle. <laughs> Since he came into office, the one thing he's actually shown results on is rolling back uh, regulations that Obama put in place on carbon, on fuel economy, on pollutants, you name it. He's been ramping up subsidies for fossil fuels as fast as he can, lowering royalty rates on federal lands for fossil fuel leasing. I mean, just go down the list. It's not subtle. I mean, just looking at the practicalities, right? Whoever's elected, one of the big kind of looming international events in the calendar will be COP26, the big UN climate conference that was planned for November this year, but has been pushed back because of the COVID crisis into 2021. Now, how much difference do you think it would make if Biden was at the helm rather than Trump when that happens? Well, Biden loves international cooperation. He was involved in negotiating Paris. He has great relationships with leadership in other countries, and he's declared he wants to get back in Paris and resume a leadership role. So, David, look, I'm thinking could, especially you've got Europe doing similar kind of energy transition, could a Biden presidency use trade levers to influence, say, for example, China to change its energy policy as well? Yes, I think that's a lever, and I think Biden would be open to that. But there's also a really interesting policy debate going on around this. What's more effective, penalize countries and try to crank down levers of sort of punishment like taxes or invest their own resources in making clean energy cheaper? New renewable energy is getting cheaper and cheaper. Every time we double renewables capacity, costs fall another whatever, 15%. If that keeps going on, it's just going to be dirt cheap to build renewables everywhere in the world really soon. So driving costs down as fast as possible arguably does more to induce China to act than penalizing China. David Roberts, journalist at Vox. But whatever happens in November, China remains the biggest piece of the climate change puzzle. It produces almost a third of the world's emissions, as much as the US and the EU combined. So is China on board with the green recovery agenda? Decisions about China's economic response to the COVID crisis are being made right now. The country's top legislative body, the National People's Congress, or NPC, is in full session in Beijing. Li Shuo is a senior climate and energy policy officer at Greenpeace East Asia in Beijing. So the National People's Congress, it is one of the most important political events every year in China. And this year, the importance of this meeting is even more because of COVID-19. Thousands of political elites uh, gather here in Beijing and they will address a broad range of social and economic issues, including as has been proposed by the premier, not to set 
an annual GDP growth target for this year, and this is very, very significant. This is unprecedented. And I think the fact that the Premier proposed not to set that target is on one hand because the economic difficulties as a result of COVID-19. The other reason is to pursue a better quality recovery. What does that mean? Uh, So if you look back to 2008, when China was hit by the global financial crisis, the government introduced a 4 trillion RMB stimulus package to try to revive the economy. But the fixation on economic growth and GDP also resulted in a lot of stranded assets, coal-fired power plants, more than what we need, real estate projects, more than the Chinese residents can actually leave in. So what signals are you getting that it's changing? Because what you're getting at the moment is very broad brush stuff. How much has been decided already and how much is there to play for in all of this, do you think? Well, it is still up for grab. Should the so-called new infrastructure projects be prioritized, digital, low carbon and high tech projects. I think it is the intention of the government to to favor those policies. But on the other hand, a big question mark is can the country do that without pursuing some of the old and traditional infrastructure projects, for example, coal-fired power plants. China has already got way more coal projects than we need. So to add in further capacity will actually not burn coal, but actually money. And this type of measures will not help us with addressing the current crisis and will easily get us into a new one on the environment. One clear signal that was quite worrisome, frankly, is that the economic consideration will, in the short term, trump all the other issues, including climate change and environmental protection. I think that was very clearly laid out in the report of the government. Already in the past month, we've observed deteriorating air quality compared to last year. Yeah, I mean, there was a very interesting indicator of the kind of ambiguity of the Chinese position when it delayed announcing its emissions targets for COP26, the UN climate change conference that's been delayed to 2021. How significant was that? How did you read that? Well, so China still uh, has the rest of this year to provide clarity on its intention. I don't think we can sugarcoat this. The domestic economic and political situation are not in favor of higher environmental aspiration. Listen, how much do you think depends on what happens in the U.S.? Obviously, it's a very antagonistic position between China and the U.S. at the moment. But at the same time, we've got a Democratic presidential candidate, Joe Biden, who might take a very, very different attitude to the environment. How much difference do you think a Biden presidency would make for China's energy and environmental policies? Well, I think that will make a very, very clear difference. The U.S. position looms very large in China's political calculus. I think there is indeed a feeling here in China that it is unfair for Beijing to move forward with its climate agenda, where at the same time the U.S. is moving backward. That is one of the major barriers for China to embrace higher climate ambitions. So a changing of the U.S. political direction will certainly have a very profound implication for China. Li Shuo of Greenpeace China. So it may actually be the decisions of U.S. voters in the presidential election in November that determine the direction of China's recovery. It's pretty obvious who David Roberts at Vox will be voting for, but does he think that Biden can do it? Uh, <laughs> well, I'll just say that in 2016, I had a very strong and unequivocal answer to that question and turned out to be wildly wrong. So I've sworn off predictions. I will say that all the recent polls show Biden ahead, but I've you know, U.S. politics has become so volatile and so crazy that it's difficult to predict what's going to happen next week, <laughs> much less in November. And you've been burnt before, David. <laughs> Many times.
Well, that brings us to the end of today's programme, which was produced by Lawrence Knight. Do tune in on Friday when Manuela Saragossa will be taking a much more detailed look at the EU's new spending plans and what it means for European integration. And Business Daily will, of course, be back at the same time tomorrow. Welcome to Witness History with me, Farhana Hyber, and today I'm taking you back to 1971 and the publication of one of the first books to highlight the environmental and health benefits of a plant-based diet. I've been speaking to Frances Moore LePay about her book, Diet for a Small Planet. You personally have a choice. You don't have to be a victim of advertising and product placement in your supermarket. You can go in and, and choose what's best for you, what's best for the earth. We could all eat in a sustainable way. The book went on to be a bestseller and changed the way people eat. There were some reviews, and my favorite one was the Boston Globe. I loved it because the title said, Recipe for Revolution. And I thought, oh, that fella got it. <laughs> In the early 70s, Frances Moore LePay had just finished a graduate program in social work at the University of Berkeley in California. At the time, the world was facing a hunger crisis. When people turned on the evening news, it was hard to escape images of famine. It was also a time of rapid population growth. The villagers fled for their lives from their farms, and nothing was grown last season at all. So, at the moment, the territory is in the throes of spreading starvation. She's had nothing to eat except yams, and to get here, she's walked more than 40 miles. We were being told that scarcity was the reality. There just was not enough because our burgeoning population. And some gentlemen written a book called Famine 1975, basically suggesting that the U.S. was going to have to decide who could live and who could die because there was not enough. And then that was followed by the population bomb by Paul Ehrlich at Stanford. And that image of the earth being just overwhelmed by this population growth was frightening. Experts were saying that the planet just couldn't produce enough food to sustain the population and that food shortages would worsen. Frances decided she wanted to find out. Was that really the case? I was a very curious young woman, and so I thought, wait a minute, what every species does is feed itself and feed its offspring, and hey, we're supposed to be the brightest of all species, and we're failing. Frances had been a student at Berkeley, and so was able to use the university's facilities for her research. They had a great agricultural library and a very friendly librarian, and so she knew how to find the raw material. So you then immersed yourself in data about global food production? Yes, yes, absolutely. With my dad's slide rule, although I, most people today don't know what a slide rule is, but I remember <laughs> sitting there. You know, I was really doing addition and division, and literally from stack to stack, from table to table and books by the United Nations and others, I put together the numbers. What she found out went against predictions. And the numbers said, wait, wait, <laughs> you know, to me, they said, wait, wait, no, no, no. There is enough for all. There's more than enough for all in terms of calories produced. As a young woman who was just starting out, I was really scared because it seemed so obvious to me what I was finding. But this was the great breakthrough, Farhana. I realized that because I had untrained eyes, I did not come in with a filter that filtered out the obvious because all this information was out there. The information may have been out there, but it went completely counter to American culture at the time. Then we believed, oh, so much that, you know, you would literally die if you didn't eat meat with all that protein in it. I grew up in a town in Texas that was nicknamed Cowtown, and I really kind of absorbed that idea. So back in the 70s, meat was at the center of American plates. Certainly, yes. I mean, everyone aspired to that. There was a real status about meat and about high quality and about steak in particular. So I think that then vegetable plant foods have became just less well thought of. And I think that parents were concerned about their children having the best. And the best was beef. The best may have been beef, but as Frances found out in her research, cattle production was inefficient. 
she pointed out that there was more than enough calories being produced around the world. It's just too much of them went to nourish animals rather than directly to people. She put her findings together. It turned in then to a booklet. I would say it wasn't a full-length book, but it was long enough, maybe 40, 50 pages. And I thought, oh, I'll just publish that myself and share that. Well, that booklet (laughs) through a friend got into the hands of two people who had been part of Penguin in the UK, and they then branched out on their own to create Ballantine books. Those two people were Ian Ballantine and his British wife, Betty. So Mrs. Ballantyne, Betty Ballantyne, read this little booklet and she called me up and said, I'm coming out to see the Population Bomb author, Paul Ehrlich, and I wondered if you and I could meet as well because I love your ideas. So (laughs) the twist of history is that she was really on her way to the Population Bomb gentleman, but she stopped by to talk to me. Betty Ballantyne liked Frances' ideas, but she said that she should include recipes to show how people could cook with plants and vegetables and still meet their protein intake requirements. I had so much fun in the kitchen making recipes that were in this new world of plant foods. And so I set to work and I pulled in all my friends and asked them for their favorites that we could adapt to the combinations of protein. I brought home from my husband's lab a gram scale so I could balance the protein combinations. I felt like a chemist in the kitchen. It was such fun. Diet for a Small Planet was published in September 1971. It was a little paperback with sprouts of grain on the front. (laughs) More than half were recipes. The book was really just underscoring that there was enough food and there would be even more (laughs) if we weren't locked into this, what I call, protein factory in reverse. (laughs) That's one of the subtitles in the book. Not long after publication, the book started to gain media interest. With the buzz her book created, Frances was invited to TV shows mostly to talk about cooking, but she managed to communicate a much bigger agenda. When I was invited on television shows to discuss it, sometimes it was in the recipe slot, the female slot there, but I just stirred the whatever it was and talked about this big message. Finally, I got on the Today Show, that very big U.S. morning show, and the only question I got there was, Miss LePay, what did you have for breakfast? And I went from that question to the political and economic roots of hunger. So I got better and better. And I was invited to speak on college campuses, for example. Just step by step by step, it uh, began to be more widely read. I always tried to make clear to people that we had a choice. We could all eat in a sustainable way. At the time, that was considered radical. Oh, extremely radical, and especially... I found so many parents so concerned that their children were reading my book and that they couldn't be healthy. And that's really what my book did. It said that, yes, indeed, a plant-centered diet can be more healthy. Diet for a Small Planet has gone on to sell more than 3 million copies worldwide. 5% of Americans are now vegetarians. Does Frances think there has been a change in our culture around food since she wrote the book in 1971? Oh, I mean, it's earth-shaking what I feel here in the United States today. I mean, just an image. If somebody had told me when I wrote the book that here 50 years later that I would be working in an office in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and within walking distance, there are at least four restaurants featuring plant-centered food. So do you think people are now more aware that what we eat and the planet are very much connected? Yes, I think it is much more commonplace now that people know that our food choices, they ripple back and ripple out. And it's so satisfying to feel that our daily choices are connected to something positive, constructive, and part of the solution. Francis Moore Pay is working on the 50th anniversary edition of Diet for a Small Planet. Of course, she's been a vegetarian now for 50 years. She was speaking to me for Hana Hyder for this edition of Witness History. BBC World Service. Before becoming a free man, Anthony Ray Hinton set up a book club on death row. Death row is a place of hell. The laws will get you all day, all night. I 
always have used book to escape. My name is Anthony Ray Hinton. I'm going to tell you my story. Death Row Book Club, Tuesday at 8.30 and 12.30 GMT.